Okay, good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting in 2021 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. The first item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Office for Budget Responsibility as part of our budget scrutiny. We are joined today by Richard Hughes, Director, Professor Sir Charlie Bean, Budget Responsibility Committee Member, and Andy King, Budget Responsibility Committee Member. This is the first time we've taken evidence from the OBR this session, and I thank Mr Hughes and his colleagues for making the journey to Edinburgh. Uh, we have 75 minutes for discussion, and we'll need to finish promptly at just before 10.30am in time for our second session. We have been given a, a small but perfectly formed statement by the OBR, so I'd like to open up the question uh, session by first uh, asking, and I don't really mind who answers uh, this question, it's really a matter for yourselves, which members of the panel uh, answer, one or more can do so. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, in reference to your overview of the October 2021 economic and fiscal outlook from 27th of October, you stated uh, uh, in the third paragraph that um, there are supply constraints in several markets, and you say these supply bottlenecks have been exacerbated by changes in the migration and trading regimes following Brexit. We expect CPI inflation to reach 4.4% uh, next year. So I'm just wondering, um, in, in terms of the, the, you know, the consumer price index, what is your view on how that will impact on the Treasury GDP deflator? Because that's obviously very important uh, for the, 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 the setting of budgets in Scotland. And in, in terms of the supply situation and the bottlenecks, is this situation is improving? And when do you expect uh, the situation to return to uh, near, as near normal as possible? I can start out, and then I'll ask my, my colleague uh, Charlie to, to uh, supplement. Uh, it, it, it was the case that, compared to our forecast back in March, when we put, put our forecast together for the October budget, uh, that the recovery in demand over the course of the first part of the year was stronger than we than we had anticipated, and that meant that uh, that demand started bumping up against supply bottlenecks. It is it is easier to open up a shop and get customers into that shop than it is to provide. Um, provide goods uh, to fill it and provide those, those customers with, with goods and services. So we did end up seeing stronger inflation than we had anticipated when we did our last forecast back in March um, going into the autumn. And I should say we closed our forecast um, in, in late September um, in anticipation of it being published in late October. At that point, um, we were forecasting inflation of, of above 4%. Um, but by the time uh, we took a read of the latest gas prices and developments in prices since then, it looked as though inflation was getting closer to 5%. Um, that provided, you know, that, that obviously uh, has, has an impact on, on, on not just CPI, but also, also the deflator, which has an impact on, on the Scottish budget. Um, from the point of view of, of the Westminster budget, it has, it has uh, for the moment, uh, some beneficial effects in that one has to remember that in, uh, in, in the UK tax system, uh, both personal allowances and thresholds are frozen, which means you get more what's called fiscal drag uh, coming out of that higher inflation than you would if the government had got ahead with the indexation of those rates and thresholds. So it does deliver some fiscal benefit to the UK budget, um, some of which was spent by the Chancellor um, in his budget. So he took the benefit of both the higher taxes that he that he had he had raised, but also the additional fiscal drag to increase public spending, which then has consequences in terms of in terms of block grant uh, for the Scottish budget. So. Um, so while it's a while it's a challenging uh, challenging uh, has challenging implications for for the macro economy, it did deliver some fiscal benefit to the chancellor in the budget, which then have knock-on consequences for for the Scottish block grant. I don't know whether Charlie you want to say more about the inflation. Yes, on the supply bottlenecks, it's worth saying that uh, some of these are global in uh, in origin. So if we think of things like uh, chips for um, uh, electronic. Um, components and cars and things like that. Uh, there has been a rotation in demand to consumer electronics during the pandemic, which has led to a diversion of chips, say, that previously would have gone to car manufacturers into electronics. The Chinese have been buying up a lot of them. Uh, and the consequence of that, say, for, the, uh, for car manufacturers is they haven't been able to get enough chips, which is why you have a long uh, uh, delivery lag for getting a new car. Uh, there's obviously been particular issues in the gas market. Uh, again, some of these are uh, global uh, forces that are working through, uh, led on top of which there are particular UK uh, features. Um, 
In terms of the duration of these, uh, it's reasonable to expect businesses uh, to respond to shortages by adjusting their sources of supply, adjusting the way they operate, changing the, uh, the mix of what they put in, going back to the car example, uh, and so forth. But uh, we think it's reasonable to think that it will take the best part of next year for some of these supply shortages to um, uh, solve themselves. The other thing I think that's worth laying in here is that there are also issues in the UK labour market uh, which are relevant uh, to this. Uh, so we are seeing uh, shortages of particular sorts of labour. The classic example is HGV drivers, um, but that's not the sole uh, example. Um, and our forecast uh, was assuming that some of these would be relaxed as the furlough scheme closed and uh, some workers who were on furlough would flow into the labour market looking for new jobs. It should be said that the data that has been coming in since we closed our forecast suggests that uh, the consequential rise in unemployment as the furlough scheme ends is going to be less than we expected it to be. So there will be less of a, uh, a supply of extra labour going in uh, which leaves the labour market looking uh, relatively tight. In the past, uh, we've relied quite a lot on inward migration, uh, particularly from Europe, to ease those sorts of uh, shortages of labour. Uh, that is uh, less of an option at the moment with the new migration regime under Brexit. Uh, so one of the issues going forward will be how those labour market shortages play into wage pressures and into uh, inflation in due course. Our central forecast has inflation easing from around about 5% uh, in the spring. This is taking account of the recent gas news uh, that uh, Richard referred to uh, back towards uh, the Bank of England's 2% inflation target over the course of the uh, next year and a half or so. Uh, but we would say that the risks are very much to the upside of that if these supply shortages take longer to ease, and in particular if there's more uh, domestic wage pressure as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I'll mean, i stick with inflation. I, 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 no one's answered the question about um, CPI, I have to say, versus the Treasury deflator. But as yet, but I'm just, I, I, I was quite struck by the difference uh, in the OBR's assumed nominal earnings growth in 2022 of around 3.9% compared to 1.3% uh, uh, in regard to the Bank of England's uh, monetary report, which is quite a huge uh, differential. I mean, I think um, <laughs> most people would think that the OBR were probably nearer the mark on that, frankly, but um, I'm just wondering w w whether this, um, the Bank of England, fr from your perspective, is looking again at this and whether or not you feel that there will be implications for interest rates going forward. Now, we know that they voted 7-2 against an interest rate last month, but what's your feeling on this and how will that impact upon your, your forecasts as we go forward? The, f the first thing to say is it's a little bit um, dangerous comparing their wage numbers with our wage numbers because they refer to different measures. Right. So their, uh, their forecasts are about the uh, standard average earnings uh, measure that the Office for National Statistics produces. Because we're interested in producing fiscal forecasts, we use a constructed wage measure from... Uh, total wages and salaries in the, the national income accounts divided by the number of people. Uh, and those two measures can sometimes move in quite different ways. And uh, this particular example is one where it's due to the different measure that one's, um, uh, one's really looking at. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, monetary policy decisions, um, you know, that's obviously in the lap of uh, the MPC, who are meeting shortly uh, to take their, their latest decision. Um, having spent 14 years on the committee myself, I know it's a, a pretty hard task, so I'm not going to tell them what they should be doing. Uh, I'm sure what they will be doing, though, uh, is looking very closely 
at uh, sources of inflationary pressure. They will pay a lot of attention to things like measures of inflation expectations in financial markets. They have surveys of businesses uh, that they also uh, look at for measures of inflation expectations. They will be very alive to any sign of inflation expectations picking up. And uh, the point that I was just making about the labour market really looking surprisingly tight. Vacancies are at a uh, historically quite high level, despite the fact that the economy still hasn't regained its pre-pandemic uh, level of activity. It's about a percentage point below where we were before the pandemic uh, broke in uh, early 2020. Uh, but the labour market does look uh, really very tight. And some of that is because uh, there are some people who've left the labour force, people who've retired earlier, in some cases migrants who went uh, back home during the pandemic or migrants who might have come here, didn't come. Uh, and that uh, effective reduction in the labour force ha has meant that there are more signs of, uh, of tightness in the labour market. And I'm sure the committee will be very mindful of those uh, in deciding uh, whether it's appropriate to tighten policy. Uh, of course, you've got the factor going in the other direction, which is the new uh, COVID variant, the Omicron variant, which, given there's still uncertainty about the consequences of that, uh, they may feel, well, let's wait a little bit longer till the, uh, the scientists have a, a better hold on the implications. Uh, you asked about the implications for us, of course, uh, a key factor in determining debt interest is the level of interest rates. And uh, debt interest is more sensitive now to changes in monetary policy than it was in the past. It's partly because the stock of debt is bigger, but it's also because the maturity, average maturity of the total liabilities of the public sector, so that's adding the Bank of England uh, together with uh, government. Because the Bank of England has been buying government debt and issuing uh, reserves to, to finance it under its quantitative easing programme, and those reserves pay bank rate, the rate that the Monetary Policy Committee sets. So when the MPC decides to raise bank rate, it will have a pretty immediate pass through to debt interest effectively. Okay, thank you. Um, now, one of the issues, of course, with the OBR is it doesn't necessarily have access to uh, the kind of uh, data that it perhaps requires to look specifically at Scottish circumstances. Is there any specific data streams that you believe could be added to make your forecasting in a Scottish context uh, more accurate? I suppose we do approach our forecasts for Scottish taxes differently from the SFC, and I think there is value at doing these forecasts from different perspectives um, because they provide checks on each other. We take a sort of necessarily top-down approach when we look at estimating the tax basis for things like Scottish income tax um, by just estimating what we think is the Scottish share of the tax base um, and then applying uh, the policy rates on top. Um, we have had the benefit of it, of, of outturn data um, uh, starting in 2016-17, uh, if memory serves, and which then provides a check against what were initially just estimates on what we thought the tax base was rather than what the actual tax base was. Um, and we, we've also more recently had the benefit of, of RTI data, the real-time information that HMRC have started to produce about, uh, about how much tax is coming in and the composition of, of, of taxpayers. Um, which comes in on a high frequency basis, which started uh, during the pandemic. So that's provided us with much more real time information about who is paying who, who is paying tax and how much um, on an on an in year basis. Um, in terms of what more information we would like, um, I might ask Andy if there's anything which he, he, he wishes he had in putting putting together these forecasts. Um, well, I think. Uh, as Richard says, the, uh, the volume of data we have now that we can uh, look at uh, in a Scotland-specific way for the majority of the taxes that we forecast for Scotland is, uh, is good. So now that the uh, property tax system and the landfill tax system are fully devolved, that means that the uh, 
uh, tax data is, is the best current information we can have. Uh, we are now, I guess, more practiced in using the real-time information for the uh, PAYE part of income tax. And so, uh, in terms of the starting point for the forecast, I think that's as good as you will get. That, that's better data than uh, labour force survey data on uh, the tax base. Uh, because it's a it's a census in effect rather than a, a survey. What we miss out on is, uh, in particular, the is the self-assessment population, about 10% of the income tax base, where the tax system only provides information once a year uh, with a long lag when people pay in January, uh, and then it takes another month or so for the data to be cleaned up and analysed. So what we miss out on is uh, if there are, the way we produce forecasts, if there are differential trends in self-employment or other parts of the, the non-saving, non-dividend, non-PAYE tax base, uh, we won't pick them up. Um, I think for the SFC, similarly, uh, there's no cross-check for them from the tax system for the bottom-up way they produce the forecast. So for both of us, the, the non-PAYE part of income tax is, the, is where the data is least helpful. Um, but all of these things are, are essentially talking about the data that helps you understand the starting point. So because the income tax system uh, has been devolved on a liabilities basis, so not the way the cash arrives in HMRC, there's a certain amount of forecasting what has already happened because you won't know the outturn for a, a very long time because of the self-assessment lags. What is uh, common to both SFC and us is the forecast challenge. So uh, when we are looking to forecast the share of the UK total that will be Scottish, we have population projections that we take into account, but then essentially all the other things that uh, determine the trend in tax per head here versus UK-wide, these are all forecast judgments. So it's not lack of data, it's the, it's the rather more standard problem of uh, predicting the future, given the information you have to hand. Um, I mean, how, how accurate over the last few years has LBR been relative to the SFT? Because over the next five years, there are significant differences. Uh, in fact, uh, the SFT predicts uh, that uh, in, in five years, the, the tax take will be 486 million more in Scotland than the LBR does. And what's interesting is that, you know, um, you know, um, Scottish uh, landfill tax, uh, they predict 78 million, uh, sorry, uh, the OBR predicts 78 million coming in from that, but uh, the SFT predicts only 18 million because of the impact of policy, which is, you know, 60 million pound of a difference, of, you know, between 78 and 18 million, it's quite a huge difference in terms of the, that particular aspect of tax. So uh, how is, uh, for in order for us to, to look at how the OBR is doing relative to the SFT, is, how, how have you done over the last few years in terms of the accuracy of the predictions relative to each other? In, in the devolved tax, uh, taxes document that we, taxes spending forecast document that we produce alongside the budget, we did look back at the accuracy of our forecast versus outturn. Um, and in, in chart A, you can see that there is, you know, we got it, we got it quite wrong at the beginning, but that was basically because nobody knew what the tax base was um, until we got outturn data in 2016-17. We were out by about 700 million. Since then, I think what you have seen on both our parts, but I think also the Scottish Fiscal Commission has been a learning process, which has helped to reduce those forecast errors. You know, they are now down to kind of within within 200 million a year, um, and and most recently they were they were less than 100 million in in terms of forecast errors for Scottish income tax, and so I think that does show that we are we are kind of learning how these systems operate as we go. We're taking advantage of of hard data as it comes out. One of the things which we have we have started doing in our publications and the SFC have done the same is in all of it when they produce their forecast and we produce ours to always produce a, a comparison and where we can a reconciliation for where we've produced different estimates of those taxes from the SFC and what explains them because we produce our forecasts at different times that's oftentimes explains the differences uh, in in what we expect to be the yields from different taxes and especially over the last 18 months, it's been a particularly uh, volatile environment in which to try and forecast. Um, and uh, as, as we've learned more about uh, the evolution of the pandemic, uh, uh, effectiveness of vaccines, prospects for reopening the economy, 
pace at which that 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 was going that would that would be done, um, and the outlook for inflation, all, all those things have had implications for what we've we've each forecast for um, for taxes. And I think a, a lot of the explanations that you find for any forecast differences between ourselves just comes down to the fact that there are a few months between us, and a few months is a long time in in forecasting these days. Um, I think. Uh, if one one hopes that things start to settle down a bit economically, and that would mean that you'd see a bit more consistency between what we say in one month and what the fiscal commission says and says in another. Okay, well, thanks for that. Just one final question from me before we open up to colleagues around the table, um, and uh, that's basically with regard to taxation. You said in your submission that um, uh, the the level of GDP which will be uh, raised in tax will be 36.2 per cent. It's high since the early 1950s by 2026-27. Uh, and you've said that uh, taking um, the last two budgets together, chance of raised taxes more this year than any single year since so Norman Lamont and Ken Clark's two 1993 budgets in the aftermath of Black Wednesday. Now, six weeks have passed since he actually uh, wrote this paper on the 27th of October. So I'm just wondering what impact um, you feel that this um, is having on future growth projections, uh, given the weeks you've had to kind of analyse this further? In terms of the implications, I mean, our, our growth projections are consistent with what was announced in terms of tax policies. Um, and, and uh, I, mean, I mean, one thing to say about those forecasts is that you know, the government has decided to raise a very large amount in tax um, over, over the coming five years, both from personal taxes um, and from and from corporate taxes, you know, we take account of the sort of second round effects of those those taxes um, on on incomes um, and on economic decisions. Uh, but it is it is the case that this is this is partly the sort of the beginning of uh, of of the UK's demographic transition, which is that we have an aging society, fewer and fewer people are in work compared to those in retirement, and much of those tax rises are to fund basically a larger post pandemic state. Um, I, I think some people have allied those tax increases to somehow paying for the pandemic, um, and then and then that creates some some, uh, and that means that there's somehow temporary tax rises because they're dealing with a temporary cost. If you look at what they're actually paying for out over the medium term, therefore dealing with net zero, therefore paying for a larger health service, um, and and uh, they are for paying for um, for for the government's other. Uh, public spending plans, all of which are a permanent increase in, in, in the size of government. So uh, you know, from, from the point of view of if the government wants to meet its fiscal rules based on our forecast, these are permanent tax rises that need to be delivered if the government is going to meet, meet those borrowing targets. And they reflect the fact that you've got a working age population which is shrinking, you've got to tax it more um, compared, to, compared to a population in retirement that is benefiting both from uh, you know, the welfare provision as well as, the, as, well as a uh, health service which provides the services that they're looking for. The, 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 the Institute of Fiscal Studies has said that the, 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 the policies have been led by the OBR, so we'll be asking them about that subsequently. Okay, um, Deputy Convener, to ask questions next, followed by Liz. Thank you, <coughs> Convener. I, I really wanted to follow on very much from uh, the Convener's line of questioning regarding income tax uh, forecasts. I, I mean, and, and this is of critical importance, uh, you know, since the, the introduction of the fiscal framework in, in terms of it's a very large component of what we have available to spend in Scotland. And so, therefore, I'm interested in understanding why the OBR are projecting, albeit that, that there is growth, uh, or project, projected growth in income tax uh, receipts in Scotland, that that growth is slower than the rest of the, the UK. Uh, if for no other reason that you know, it seems to me that, that if that is the case, then that should be a real focus for public policy in Scotland to see what we can do to mitigate that. So it, it, I was just hoping that you'd be able to explain the underlying assumptions behind that that that, that uh, forecast. Yeah. So, um, so the I mean, first and foremost, the driver of that relative uh, growth rate is the population projections. Uh, that we take into account. So uh, these are ONS population projections, um, but they show uh, a slower growth in the working age population, slower growth in the adult population in Scotland than in the UK as a whole, uh, which is largely down to differences in, I think, I think largely down to differences in net migration assumptions. Um, but that uh, relative decline in the share of the population uh, that lives in Scotland, we um, 
uh, feed through uh, proportionately to the income tax forecast. Uh, we also, uh, as we described, we use the real-time information from the PAYE system to uh, look at how uh, income tax liabilities in Scotland are likely to have changed since the most recent outturn year, which is uh, 18 months ago uh, up to now. Uh, and that, at the moment, is showing quite a significant decline mm -hmm. in the Scottish share of income tax liabilities. So the combination of the two, those are the factors that we take into account when, uh, you know, when um, judging the share of uh, UK-wide income tax liabilities that will be uh, raised in Scotland. Uh, so that's the that's the sum total of the of the story. We do we also take into account where um, UK government uh, policy measures will are likely to have different effects in Scotland than in the UK as a whole. Uh, but those effects are much smaller than these uh, top-down adjustments about the population and RTI. Thank you. I mean, just following on from that, and, and, and bearing in mind, I think what Mr. Hughes was saying regarding the, the attempts of the, the OBR and, uh, to, to, and the SFC to reconcile their methodologies. I mean, I note from your paper uh, that that, that um, it looks as though it will be a sort of a three hundred eighty million pound difference between what you are forecasting in terms of income tax receipts and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Could you just provide a summary of, of, of what that difference of opinion is? I mean, given that I'm assuming that the SFC are, are looking at the same demographic uh, figures that you are. Yes, yeah, so um, as, as Richard mentioned, one of the key things is timing. And at the moment, because there are just such large movements in uh, tax receipts as the economy is closed, reopened, uh, and there are surprises relative to assumptions about how winding down the furlough scheme will impact. So I think we had two or maybe three months more data on RTI when we closed our forecast than the SFC would have had, and that was uh, a negative surprise, so that was a downside surprise that we would have factored in. But then there are uh, more straightforward differences of forecast judgment uh, around the labour market where I think our forecast is somewhat more, our forecast for wages and salaries growth are very similar, um, but ours is more employment rich, the SFCs is more average earnings rich, and the latter is more tax rich. Now, they may be right, we may be right, uh, more likely than not we'll both be wrong, um, but but those are those are kind of more straightforward forecast judgments. So taking those things in mind and, and, and stepping back a little bit and being very much in mind what uh, Sir Charlie was saying earlier about we're in a situation that has, is not panning out as predicted. We're seeing significant labour market frictions. We're seeing, I think, significant differential frictions between different sectors in the, the economy. Um, uh, uh, it strikes me that in that situation, making these sorts of predictions around uh, future earnings becomes a lot more difficult because actually you need to forecast almost on a, rather than a macroeconomic, a microeconomic basis, actually what is happening in each of these individual sectors. Is that a, a fair summary? And indeed, what's the OBR doing to look at actually how, how can we actually drill into some of these very specific issues in specific sectors and then extrapolate for, for the wider economic outlook. And that's exactly how we've had to change the way we forecast over the course of the pandemic, because it's been such a sectorally differentiated shock with some sectors like hospitality at the beginning losing about 90% of their output, while other sectors where you could easily work from home or remotely, like financial services, facing uh, much less, sort of 10% max uh, sort of falls in output at the peak of the first lockdown. We've had to necessarily take a more sectorally differentiated approach to trying to understand the implications of the pandemic for the near-term outlook. And, and if you look at our forecast documents since the pandemic started, we've, we've provided a sort of month-by-month -month sectoral breakdown of how output evolves um, to support our overall macro judgment on where we think GDP is going. Um, and it is, it is very difficult to predict because it comes down to 
uh, you know, we start by talking to epidemiologists and public health experts about when they expect different parts of the economy to be able to be reopened. Um, when that goes to plan, that tends to support where our forecasts go. Um, in the areas where we, we, you know, we end up locked down for longer, um, our forecasts turn out to be turn out to be uh, wrong. The other thing which we've had to take account of is how consumers and businesses have changed their behaviour over the course of the pandemic. Um, Charlie was alluding to this sort of rotation in consumption that you saw um, over the course of the pandemic, where early on consumption just fell, but then consumers figured out ways of buying what they used to buy in shops online, and then suddenly consumption popped up again in retail. Then uh, and, uh, uh, sort of buying goods and services, sort of, sort of buying goods, and then when the service sector opened up, you saw consumption rotate back again into services and less into goods, and trying to keep trying to keep up with the changing composition of consumption and how people have adapted to the pandemic has also been a challenge for us. And I think it's fair to say that we've we've consistently underestimated how adaptable consumers and businesses have proven to be to the pandemic. And one of the things which explains why. Um, we will, we're, we're putting out a publication on Thursday looking back at our forecasts for the pandemic period for 2020. And one of the things which we did is, is uh, consistently underestimated basically how much consumption there was going to be and how much businesses were going to be able to sell people. Um, because as you went through the pandemic, more and more consumers found ways of shopping online. Businesses found ways of um, either operating through deliveries or providing services through other means, which meant that the economy has become increasingly resilient to uh, sort of pandemic uh, pandemic conditions and public health restrictions, which is sort of um, sort of meant that there's been some upside surprises on the way in which we forecast. But you still have some sectors like air transport, um, where you know, your restrictions still play a really significant role in holding back uh, holding back output, even going into next year. Specific to the income tax forecast, one of the one of the real benefits of the RTI data is that it can be cut into whatever breakdowns uh, you need to understand what's happening uh, and it is very close to real time so uh, we were able to analyze why the Scottish share had fallen uh, in the outturn period with uh, the oil and gas sector playing a, a significant role um, now understanding where you are is uh, having a good understanding of where you are is obviously beneficial for forecasting, but there's still huge uncertainty over what assumption you should make about how uh, permanent or temporary an event is and how, if it's temporary, how quickly it will unwind. And so even taking those, those kind of micro style forecasting rather than pure top-down macro forecasting, there's still just a series of of judgments to make about what happens next. And so it will always, I think, be the case that the SFC, even if we were faced with precisely the same information set, you know, the reason why you have two expert committees is that you will get two views. Uh, or no, maybe not the reason why, but the reality is that. Uh, you had both come up with exactly the same answer. We'd uh, be asking much tougher questions. But uh, on that basis, I'll, I'll finish there, convener, and hand over to the next. Thank you question. very much, Daniel. A list before by Joan. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor Bean, can I take you back to some interesting comments you made when you were referring to your uh, impending meeting with the MPC committee and what was focusing their minds about inflation and specifically on the causes of inflation? How easy is it with uh, economic data to home in on what are the cost push factors in inflation, um, many of which have been spoken to us about in previous um, economy sessions where people have come to us with a strong feeling that cost push inflation has been very strong, and what is demand-led inflation? The key thing for the MPC uh, when you get... Um, supply shocks, cost shocks, if you want to call them that, is whether they're going to lead to sustained inflation. The sort of standard uh, mantra of, of inflation targeting central banks is if you have a one-off supply shock, uh, you look through it, you let it feed through into inflation, you don't try and uh, offset it in the short run, you accept higher inflation temporarily. Um, but what you really want to guard against happening is that um, blip up in inflation 
feeding through to generate an ongoing wage price spiral of the sort that we saw in the 1970s. Uh, and that's why uh, central banks, including the Monetary Policy Committee, pay a lot of attention to inflation expectations indicators, because that's something that tells you when people's inflation psyche has shifted unless they are going to presumably be starting to mark up prices more because they expect their input costs to be rising, looking for higher wage increases to compensate them for the inflation they expect to be coming uh, down the road. Uh, so that's always the thing that uh, central banks uh, will be on the, the lookout for. And I, I would be certain at this juncture that would be something the MPC would be looking very closely at their uh, indicators of inflation expectations. So would it be correct to assume that um, because of some of the um, blockages in the system that you mentioned earlier, specific some of the tight things within the labour market um, and not necessarily being able to fill some of the jobs that are available, is it your understanding that that expectation factor might actually be increasing? Um, I think there's a good argument for the shortages in goods markets, the um, chips shortages that I started talking about uh, earlier, for instance, or for that matter, actually, in the, uh, the gas market, where we would expect gas uh, prices, wholesale gas prices, to be falling back. Uh, once the uh, short-term issues uh, ease. Uh, it's reasonable to think those sorts of issues will solve themselves. Uh, for me, the concern would be much more uh, whether we may see problems developing in the labour market. Because the labour market is tight and there are shortages of some sorts of labour, uh, these are more like the circumstances when you might see uh, the supply shock that we've had having some so-called second round effects uh, with wage inflation starting to pick up and so forth. So, so that will be a key judgment that the MPC has to draw. And how easy is it to understand uh, when it comes to these uh, labour uh, market problems how much of that's being caused by uh, the Brexit issue? How much of it is being caused by people who not necessarily have the, uh, or not necessarily the right skills mm -hmm. available to take up the jobs, but actually the willingness to do these jobs? How easy is it to sort of drill down? Uh, on? Well, well um, you would certainly try to get relevant indicators of these sorts of factors. So um, uh, the issue of what uh, economists refer to it as skill mismatch, where people have the wrong skills for the, uh, the job openings that are, uh, are opening uh, up. Uh, and obviously the potential solution for that is retraining and, uh, and if you drive up the pay in the um, occupations uh, where the shortage is, then that sucks people into it and encourages them to get the skills and so forth. But it takes time. But you can look at indicators of that. So obviously splitting up vacancies by uh, occupation, by region, uh, even by sector, uh, and comparing that with uh, the skills of the people who are looking for work, um, where they are and so forth, uh, would be what you do. And actually, we uh, do some of that in the, um, the book that we uh, published, The uh, Economic and Fiscal Outlook. There are some, uh, is some examination uh, of that. Uh, so you can you can dig into uh, some of these things. You raised the question about uh, uh, Brexit, though. Um, I think it's difficult to deny that potentially has uh, a role, because uh, if you go back, uh, say, to the the period in the years immediately before the financial crisis, and and for that matter, um, uh, after the financial crisis, but before the the vote to leave, uh, a, an important safety valve for firms, if they couldn't get labour domestically, would be to look overseas to hire. So there was a very elastic supply uh, of labour. Uh, that uh, labour is no longer so elastically available. 
because of the migration regime. And the, the key thing is how the migration policy regime uh, operates here. It's not necessarily Brexit per se, because you can operate a migration regime uh, which would allow relatively uh, free inflows of labour, which is in short supply. But uh, So everything hinges on how the government chooses to operate that migratory regime. But if, uh, if it's operated in a way that is quite restrictive, mm. that will increase the uh, bargaining position of labour um, and it will tend to generate more of these second round effects that I was for, uh, talking about. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting, because I think in, in Scotland we've obviously got specific sectors like hospitality and uh, some of the uh, tourist uh, areas where there's been a very significant problem. Um, so I'm just interested to, to know how that's sort of measured. My, my final question is very much about um, the Chancellor's uh, budget, which uh, he made a decision uh, to be a bit more demand-led, uh, in other words, to ensure that public spending was at a higher level than it might have been and to uh, increase some taxes. Do, do you feel that that uh, budget has led to some uh, increase in the demand side of the economy, so that that's having an impact on, on inflationary pressure? Um, certainly our uh, assessment uh, in the EFA, because we uh, quite specifically do an estimate of the macroeconomics of the macroeconomic effects of the package, uh, and uh, it added uh, was it half a percent of GDP, is my recollection, uh, to a, a sort of net demand stimulus, and that would add a bit to inflationary pressures, uh, precisely through the sorts of channels that I've just been talking about. Um, uh, Richard alluded uh, earlier on to uh, the recovery having been stronger than uh, we and some other forecasters expected. I think what's uh, also the case is that it seems like demand has rebounded more rapidly than supply. If you go back to early on this year, uh, we, and I think the MPC and a lot of other forecasters, thought that demand might lag behind supply, so you needed supportive policies uh, to bump up demand as the economy reopened to match supply. I think what we've seen suggests actually uh, demand had enough legs on its own and actually was running a little bit ahead of supply. Uh, and our forecast embodies that judgment. Thank you. John, to be followed by Michelle. Thanks so much, convener. Um, quite a lot of areas that we've covered already that are quite interesting. I mean, one of the points was made that was people people have adapted, I don't know if it was yourself, Mr King, uh, more than you maybe had expected uh, through the whole system. And that made me think, um, have, do you think people have learned that they actually need some savings in case they hit another pandemic or a crisis of some kind? And would that have an impact uh, going forward if people were to save more? Or is there just no evidence that people are, are going that way? So it, it, is, it is the case that the savings ratio went up a lot during the pandemic. Um, and I think there's, the, but I think one has to ask the question, to what extent was that people decided they wanted to save more or basically people being forced to save more because they couldn't find ways of spending their money either because they couldn't go to shops or they couldn't go on things like holidays, which is what people oftentimes save, save money for. We saw the savings ratio hit kind of post-war highs um, in, in, sort of in double digits uh, at the height of the pandemic. Um, Initially, we did think that it might stay stay high, um, but we've revised it progressively down to something closer, which is the sort of historical average of around 5% um, over the medium term. But you still have that built up um, savings people accumulated over the course of the pandemic, which we expect to be unwound relatively slowly, um, so that at, at the pace of about 5% a year, um, if, if memory memory serves. And, and, and that is because, uh, so all the sort of surveys of how people spend windfalls is that they don't spend it all at once. They tend to want to smooth their consumption over time. I think what what what, what we haven't concluded really is that there's a, a significant, significant increase in the rate of precautionary saving over the medium term. People unwind that kind of war chest they built up slowly, but what they don't do is permanently save significantly more than we'd estimated before. And that's just based on 
sort of survey, surveys of households suggest that that's not the lesson they learned from the pandemic. Um, you know, the vaccine has to some extent allowed much of our lives to go back to normal, but with important caveats about uh, the, the emergence of, of new variants. And I think also government support for those out of work was very generous in the form of the furlough scheme and other, other kinds of support, which has meant that uh, sort of government borrowing uh, came to people's rescue rather than them having to save up um, to deal with hits to their income uh, themselves. And so they, they may well have learned a lesson um, that government government is there when uh, when they need it um, to uh, to provide them with support through these kind of these kind of events. Um, uh, Charlie, is anything you want to add to that? Um, well, first of all, uh, it's worth saying that these are pretty large amounts of money that you're talking about. So there's this sort of uh, forced savings that households have uh, undertaken. It's of the order of a couple of hundred billion. Um, the, the, the big picture of the pandemic, if you like, is that government policy has pretty much preserved incomes, but households have not been able to spend because the economy has been closed. Uh, so uh, they've accumulated it. Uh, some of it has leaked into the housing market, probably. Uh, some of it will have been invested. A lot of it appears to be uh, still held in liquid form in bank accounts and so forth. Um, and a, the key question that forecasters have been grappling with is how quickly those savings might be unwound. As Richard says, the sort of standard view is that um, people don't blow it all at once. You know, there's only so many slap-up meals and exotic <laughs> holidays and so forth you can have. It's more that, you know, you have a, a, a higher standard of living for many years in the future, and about 5% a year would be consistent with empirical evidence uh, from lots of study of how consumers behave when they have these sorts of uh, windfalls. Um, I think the other thing I'd inject here is that it's important to realise the impact has been different across households. So it's not every household has had this, uh, this uh, windfall in income. Um, uh, for some often older, higher income households, something like me, um, you know, I stopped doing lots of spending that I would normally do, but my income was largely preserved. Uh, but there are also plenty of households who actually, because of the safety net the government was providing was less effective for them, maybe self-employed, some sorts of workers in uh, more fragile jobs and so forth. Um, uh, for them, they, uh, they haven't been in the happy position of being able to accumulate savings. Some of them have had to accumulate significant debts. So you do have important heterogeneities across the, the population. That also complicates uh, an assessment of what happens going forward. OK, that's, that's helpful. So, so I mean, that, that's looking specifically at one area, i.e. savings, um, and... If I'm understanding you correctly, there's going to be a kind of med short to medium term impact, but in the long term, you're really expecting things to go back to normal. So on the wider issue of scarring in, in the whole economy, it, it, is that basically the same story, that in the short to medium term, both the pandemic and Brexit are having a scarring effect, but in the long term, we'll get back to normal without them? Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, we assume there is literally a permanent effect uh, of the pandemic. So if the pandemic had not happened, the level of GDP uh, would be higher than the trajectory it is now on. Uh, and the hit that we have in the medium to long term is 2%. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. We've always been very clear um, this is territory we're very unsure about. Um, the sources of that uh, hit uh, it, it come through a variety of channels. So there's an effect on uh, essentially the labour force. Uh, part of that is, is just a population effect because uh, there's been a significant number of uh, deaths. Uh, but uh, also the migration effect that we've talked about, um, uh, that plays uh, in, and, and the pandemic potentially has affected some of those uh, migratory movements permanently. 
it is likely that some older workers uh, have decided to leave the labour force earlier than they would otherwise have done as a result of the pandemic, in some cases because their job disappeared, in other cases because they've become you know, more conscious of their own mortality. Uh, we do know some younger workers went into uh, or stayed on in education. Now, they will come back in in due course. Uh, it's also true that um, more flexible ways of working, the ability to work at home may encourage uh, some people, particularly, say, uh, 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 married women, uh, may be able to participate more easily. So there's factors going both ways there. Uh, there's an effect that may not be fully permanent, may take quite a long time, which is uh, accommodating structural changes in the economy of the sort that we were uh, talking about, people not having the right skills and having to retrain and so forth. And that can raise the level of unemployment to the equilibrium level of unemployment uh, for a, a while. So there's a bundle of things uh, in terms of the effective size of the labour force. Um, uh, of our 2% hit, uh, memory serves right, that's 0.8 percentage points in a sort of indicative decomposition. Don't take these numbers too literally because I've already stressed a lot of uncertainty about them. Sorry, that point eight, 2% is the permanent effect. What's the 0.8%? Yeah, uh, 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 that, that's the labour force component. Ah, sorry. Right, OK, right, so right, I'm going to give you right. two more bits of it, uh, which will all right. add up to, right. to the, the uh, two percentage point hit. The second bit is that investment has been depressed during the pandemic. You know, businesses, not surprisingly, have held off investing. Um, uh, the uncertainty and so forth. Uh, there we've got some data, so we can, uh, uh, we've got a pretty good uh, fix on how much uh, investment um, has not taken place, which otherwise probably would have done. Um, and you can work out roughly the output consequences of that. That's worth 0.6 percentage points. Uh, the other bucket is the, the bit that economists really don't understand, but is the big driver of the improvement in living standards, which is... Uh, improvements in knowledge, uh, in the way you do things, new products, uh, stuff that's generated from R&D, all of that sort of stuff. Um, uh, there, uh, we think the long run level hit from that because investment in intangibles, uh, research and development, things like that, have also been hit in the same way as uh, physical investment. Uh, the hit there is, at, again, 0.6. Uh, um, so that it's coming from lots of different channels, and this is not something you, you make up, uh, particularly since it's been a global pandemic. So lots of countries have gone through the same experience. The world would have been a better place uh, or a richer place if we hadn't had the pandemic, and that's completely aside from the health consequences. OK, I'll leave it to that. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle, to be followed by Douglas. Good morning. Uh, possibly uh, following on the uh, pandemic, um, I suppose I'm a bit surprised uh, that at the reaction of the emergence of uh, Omicron in that if you'd spoken to lots of people, they would have suggested it was highly likely that another variant would go into the population. So I'm interested in exploring with you to what extent you have baked the impact of these waves into your economic modelling and specifically the, the points you've made about separation of sector and so on. There's a whole range of variables which I totally appreciate. But I'm interested in understanding the extent to which you've done that and how it will reframe your modelling going forward, given, I think it was yourself, uh, uh, Sir Charlie, you made a comment about QE, how, in effect, it's here to stay and the impact it's having on debt going forward. So it's just some of your reflections, what you're doing differently now, what you will absolutely, definitely do differently in the future, and in particular, what that means uh, for Scotland, if you've got any insights on that in terms of your modelling. 
probably can, can uh, supplement it. But uh, the risk of a new variant has always been on our radar as, as a risk. And, and one of the things which we did over the course of the pandemic was always look at not just a central scenario, but a set of scenarios, one where you had very effective vaccines rapidly rolled out and the economy reopened and, you, when we, were, and we quickly got back to a pre-pandemic world, but another where um, you did have new variants which, uh, which for, uh, against which vaccines were ineffective. In our central forecast, which we, which we did at the end of October, we did assume some rise in cases over the winter, not necessarily of a new variant, just a rise in cases of the old Delta variant because people were mixing uh, you know, more uh, in closer quarters, colder weather. We knew that, we knew that, that was going to have an impact. Um, on transmission. And we also know that regardless of what the government does with public health policy, when people see case numbers go up, um, they tend to they tend to rein back on, on consumption um, for, for, through what's called voluntary social distancing. Um, so there is some, we already baked in some slowdown in consumption going into the winter on the basis of what we expected to be a rise in case numbers. Um, what we don't know yet is what the public health response is going to be to the new Omicron variant. We don't know. We don't know very much about the science of it. I think the one thing. The one thing that I that I would say though is that um, even if it leads to um, another lockdown of the sort that we've seen um, in in response to uh, rising hospitalizations um, and deaths in in previous pandemics, what we what we do now know and what we can try and anticipate better in our forecasts is that. Our, our economy is increasingly adapted to these kind of conditions. The first lockdown lost us about 25% of, of output. The second lockdown lost us less than half of that. You, you'd sort of anticipate that um, we, are, we are learning how to live with the virus more effectively, even when we can't walk into shops and buy things, even when we can't go to restaurants um, and, and eat there. So uh, one thing which we are trying to get better at is you know, not just looking at what the sectoral impact of different restrictions could be, um, but also uh, try to anticipate how, how well adapted they would be when those restrictions are put in place. Um, and obviously, another uncertainty is if there are, is a need for tighter restrictions, what kind of government support is going to be provided to those sectors um, alongside, which, um, again, we, you know, we, we, we can't, if, if, if that support is rolled out, we sort of know the kind of effect it has um, in, in dealing with it. So uh, I think the so short answer is, we did have some rising cases, some sort of under consumption just based on the old variant. What we don't know yet is how different the Omicron variant is going to be to the Delta variant in terms of its impact. If it's similar to Delta, then basically it has a relatively modest impact on our, on, our, on our forecast. If it requires much tighter restrictions or something closer to lockdown conditions, then you're looking at hits to output on the order of what we saw um, back, in, back in January of, of last year. Charlie, anything you want to add? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear there's going to be some impact even just uh, through December uh, you're going to have less um, spending in hospitality and, and on travel uh, presumably so there's, there's bound to be some negative uh, impact on consumer spending and then as Richard says there may be a uh, then an issue that it, it carries through into next year if you need uh, more substantial uh, health measures for longer. It is worth saying, though, that the, the impact on GDP can sometimes turn out to be not what you expect, because it's easy to pick out what's happening to consumption. But of course, a consequence of um, Omicron is that the government is stepping up uh, vaccinations. Uh, and that boosts GDP, because the way uh, GDP is measured, it, it, it treats that as output of the health sector, as indeed it should do. Uh, so the GDP numbers may or may not uh, reveal something, but I think as far as consumption is concerned, you will see uh, some slowing over the Christmas period. Um, just leading on to another area which we've not touched on in today's session is, again, it, it's a, a sort of similar idea of how specifically you're baking in an assumption around climate change expenditure off the back of COP26, and it's something that's just not come up today. Um, where's your current thinking in your modelling that you're, you're baking in upfront costs and that will filter all the way through and longer sort of far side implications? Anyone can answer that. Isn't it? Um, so our forecasts always take uh, the UK government spending plans uh, as a starting point. So uh, in the spending review in October, there was, uh, I think, over the uh, three years or 
in fact, they presented it over the four years, including, including the current year. I think there was about £25 billion worth of uh, net zero capital spending within the plans that have been presented. Um, I, think, I think the most important thing uh, when reading our forecasts for understanding that is that that was the allocation of uh, sums from a total that had already been set. So it wasn't additional capital spending on top of the capital plans that were in our March forecast. It was the bottom-up allocation of the capital that was already there. So um, we did a lot of work in the summer on scenarios for uh, net zero capital spending. Uh, the, start, the first four years of our scenario from the summer are remarkably similar to what has transpired as government policy in the spending review. Um, thereafter, in our scenario, the amount of um, net zero capital spending continued to increase until around peaking around the end of the decade. Um, that's obviously hugely uncertain. It was a what if. Um, the, you know, the biggest uncertainty in there, I think, by far, is what happens on people's homes, domestic heating and insulation, uh, where, you know, uh, fortunately, I'm a mere forecaster and analyst, so I just have to look at the numbers rather than think about what 25 million homes disrupted with uh, building work uh, feels like to make those decisions. But that's the really that's the biggest cost. Um, it also, you know, to me, looks like the most difficult one to deal with via uh, tax as a incentive. Uh, the revealed preference across other sectors has been that regulation banning things. Is, uh, is the preferred uh, policy lever at least once a process is underway. So I think uh, you know, in the housing area, the fiscal impact might be larger in existing homes, whereas the regulatory lever is much easier to pull when you're talking about new builds, and you can tell the builders what, you know, what they have to do. Um, but the, then the flip side of all of this is what happens on the tax side, where there is one very large existing carbon tax that is not known as a carbon tax, it's known as fuel duty, uh, which the government has frozen for 10 years now. Um, as electric vehicles are, you know, take over and uh, petrol vehicles are banned, that tax, which is worth about 1.5% of GDP, simply goes away. Um, and then there are other more environmentally labelled environmental taxes, uh, most obviously the emissions trading scheme, uh, where you know, there are choices that the Westminster government can make about how many sectors are covered by that, how much that is used as an incentive to get carbon out of the system, um, where you know, clearly that's a big uncertainty, a policy uncertainty over the future of our forecasts. Um, the one thing I, I really learned from our work over the summer was just how successful the carbon price floor as a tax uh, incentive had been in kind of wiping out coal from the energy mix. So the UK does you know, provide one good example of a carbon tax doing what it is intended to do, raising some money along the way, but then ultimately uh, the revenues go away because it's successful in uh, reducing carbon. Okay, thank you. Boss? Yeah, thank you, convener. It actually follows on pretty well from what Michelle was saying. So, obviously, it's good to hear that the net zero plans, well, capital plans are sort of in the, the forecast. I guess I've got a concern about um, oil and gas and the, um, the capital plans that are under pressure not to be spent going forward. So, it's really just to have some sort of idea if those investments didn't happen. You know what that would do to the forecast. I presume it would have a greater impact on the Scottish economy as the, the rest of the UK. And I guess there then would be greater divergence between Scottish um, tax intake and the rest of the UK. And has there, so has there been any modelling done on what would happen if some of those new investments, especially in the North Sea, didn't take place? I mean, not, not that we have done, but it is the case that you've already seen in the data as a result of the pandemic, not so much as a result of any any action on net zero and climate change, of a differential impact on the Scottish economy compared to the rest of the UK, both on you know, the income tax take has been a bit lower here um, because the oil and gas sector hasn't done well during the pandemic, but also Scotland's exports have been much 
much more affected by the pandemic than the rest of the UK's exports because there's just a, there's a stronger oil and gas component to Scotland's exports um, than there is to the rest of the UK. So we, we've seen it a bit already in the in the forecasts that we produce. We haven't, I confess, done any detailed analysis of the sectoral impact of particular projects going ahead or not because um, that's at a, a level of, ag of disaggregation that's sort of below what we would do for our own forecasting purposes. But we have seen it show up in the macro data um, on on tax take as well as on exports. The forecasts that you're presenting, they are assuming many of the investments in the North Sea would, would take place. And that's and if, the, if those didn't happen, then they would have to be revised and it would probably be a negative impact to the Scottish economy. I mean, they're based on the sort of work plans that we get from uh, from, from the firms themselves um, and, and, and the taxes that would come from those. So. But I, but I couldn't speak to what specific, what specific projects are in those plans um, uh, in at, uh, uh, here because we don't provide them at that level of disaggregation. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to add, the, um, in respect of our, our forecast for the revenue from the North Sea, so the, the uh, offshore corporation tax, um, we use the oil and gas authorities uh, survey as our as the basis of our forecasts, um, which is a project by project and field by field survey. We don't look at that detail because they have access to commercially sensitive information so they package it for us um, I think the I think the key thing that uh, I'd say at this stage is uh, investment today uh, rarely yields tax revenues uh, within a five-year forecast horizon so uh, these are longer term issues um, that's just purely from the North Sea revenues now obviously Investment activity has, uh, you know, is an economic activity that will, you know, support income tax revenue. So uh, there's, there's two different ways of looking at this. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, thanks, Camille. Quite interested in, in this issue of, around stranded assets, but given time, there's one other area that I'd like to to touch on. Um, it's Charlie, you in particular have mentioned a few times that the impact of upward uh, pressure on wages um, throughout this session. I'm interested on the, the knock-on effect that that would have in terms of the, the relative value of different sectors to the overall tax base. So let's say you know, if hospitality and road haulage uh, recover from the pandemic as smaller but higher wage sectors, that's going to have a differential impact on income tax versus corporation tax versus fuel duty, etc. How, how soon are you expecting to, to have a, a strong indication of what the direction of travel is on this uh, the, the sector specific differences in, in recovery there? Um, I mean, as far as the tax uh, point is concerned, I mean, Andy will be able to expand on this, but one of the great virtues of you having access to the real time information is that you get this information quite quickly. Uh, and of course, what we would be doing when the numbers are coming in, we try to think, you know, why are these numbers? Uh, stronger than we expected or weaker than we expected. And these sorts of sectoral uh, issues might well be uh, you know, the hypothesis for why they're coming out a, a, a particular uh, way. Now, ahead of that, um, uh, we certainly will be, I think, looking at uh, sectoral uh, pressures in labour markets and uh, to the extent that we can get information on mismatch by skills, by occupation. Uh, I think um, that will be something that in coming forecast rounds uh, we will be doing. I should say I'm about to leave the committee, but uh, my replacement has just been announced, uh, who's another M former MPC member, David Miles, uh, and I'm sure he will want to pursue this uh, territory. He'll be used to, uh, to looking at these sorts of numbers during his time at the, the bank. Thanks. And do you know offhand what the, the early indications are in terms of hospitality, specifically thinking of, of the back of the questions that, that Liz Smith asked. Obviously, that has uh, any changes to the, the impact, the contribution the hospitality sector make to the tax base will have a disproportionate impact on Scotland in the same way that, say, agriculture would? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the surprising things about hospi hospitality is uh, we know there are a lot of people on furlough who came from the hospitality sector. Uh, we know there are a lot of vacancies in hospitality, and you sort of think, well, they ought to be able to 
uh, match up. But of course, the hospitality sector does rely quite heavily on migrant labour. Um, and uh, it's clear that uh, inward migration, net inward migration, uh, has fallen during the pandemic. There is some uncertainty about the, the numbers because the uh, main source of information, the International Passenger Survey, was suspended during the, uh, the pandemic. So the Office for National Statistics have tried to make indirect uh, inferences. Um, I have to say our experience in uh, the hotel we stayed at overnight is indicative that there are significant labour shortages in the hospitality sector. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm conscious of time, conveners. I'm happy to, to leave it there. Thank you very much on that very positive note, Jess. We shall, we shall end the session. We won't ask what the name of the, the hotel was. Um, I actually really want to, to thank uh, Mr Hughes and his colleagues for taking the, the time and the trouble to come all the way here to Edinburgh. It's really appreciated in current circumstances. It definitely gives you lots of brownie points from the, the committee because we much prefer evidence in this face-to-face -face, uh, situation if we can possibly get it. So uh, thanks again for all your evidence. I think we could have asked a lot more actually, in fact, if we had the time, but of course we have a very full agenda. So thank you very much for coming uh, to see us and we hope to see you before uh, too long. So uh, our next their witness will be Carol Emerson of the Institute of Fiscal Studies, uh, who will join us remotely. So I now suspend the meeting to allow final connection checks to take place, and we'll be back at 10.29, uh, ready for our 10.30 start. So thank you very much, gentlemen.
neighbour there. So we've gone time. Is, everyone, is everything OK in terms of broadcasting? Absolutely fine. OK. So we now turn to our second budget scrutiny evidence session for which we are joined remotely by Carl Emerson, Deputy Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Mr Emerson is standing in for the Director of the IFS, Paul Johnson, who is unwell. Uh, we wish him a swift recovery. I thank uh, Mr Emerson for making himself available to give evidence at short notice. Um, and welcome him to the meeting and remind members that our broadcasting team will operate their microphones so they shouldn't touch them. We have an hour for this session so it would be helpful if members could keep their questions uh, concise. Before opening the discussion, I invite Mr Emerson to make a short opening statement. Mr Emerson. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for the best wishes for Paul. I know he's very sorry that he was unable to make this session. Um, I just very briefly wanted to um, highlight that in terms of uh, Westminster budgets, there were three very substantial fiscal events in the current calendar year. Um, the budget in March, when the OBR set out a set of forecasts under the assumption that the pandemic and the economic response to it would permanently damage the economy by about 3% in the medium run, led to the Chancellor deciding that he wanted to try and put borrowing in that medium term back on track. He trimmed a bit off the spending plans, but he also announced very substantial tax rises through freezes in the personal allowance and income tax, the higher rate threshold in, in, in income tax, and a big increase in the rate of corporation tax. We then got to September when the Prime Minister announced the manifesto busting national insurance rise to be followed by the new health and social care levy in order to spend more on the NHS over the next couple of years and provide some money for social care too. And then we got to October where the OBR decided that actually, because the economy had performed more strongly than they'd expected this year, because unemployment wasn't as bad as many had feared, they felt it was re reasonable to lower the assumption of scarring in the medium term. So presented the Chancellor a better set of economic forecasts. And I think it's interesting that in response to that, the Chancellor decided to top up his spending plans and not row back on any of the tax rises that have been set out so far this year. So it got us back to a position where there's more money for the NHS over the next couple of years in particular. Spending elsewhere looks like it's in line with what was expected prior to the pandemic. Most areas of spending will now avoid cuts, but there are big tax rises um, coming through, in part justified by the big damage to the economy that was expected back in March, which, if the latest forecasts are, are right, um, wouldn't essentially have been needed. So in some sense, the Chancellor has very actively decided to go for higher taxes and higher spending um, going forwards. And I think, in part, that's probably for pressures that aren't really to do with the pandemic. I think there's a reasonable case that says, that actually, if the pandemic had no never happened, we may well have seen tax rises to spend more on things like the NHS and social care anyway. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for that. I'll open up with some questions, and then, of course, uh, I'll widen the discussion to include uh, colleagues around the table. Um, on, on 27th of October, uh, Paul Johnson said that uh, the um, budget was, and I quote, very disappointing. Uh, um, it shows that household income will be pretty stagnant at around 0.8% growth this year. Uh, he then goes on to say, this is actually awful, uh, pointing to high inflation, rising taxes, poor growth, keeping living standards virtually stagnant for another half a decade. And he went on in his uh, speech that day to say that uh, uh, average gross earnings could have been 40% higher uh, had pre-crisis trends continued. But I'm just wondering how this compares to other Western uh, countries. Well, I guess the, certainly the period since 2010 has been one of terrible um, productivity growth, and that's been associated with terrible earnings growth in the UK, and that's the figures that Paul set out. It's certainly the case that other economies have experienced pretty um, terrible economic performance over that period too. I think the U it's fair to say the UK was harder hit by the financial crisis because it had a bigger financial sector um, to start with. So the, the legacy of that is bigger. Part of the effect is due to the economic consequences of Brexit, which clearly is something felt largely by the UK economy and not others. And then there's the effect of the pandemic, um, which is having an assumed scarring effect, although of course it's too early to tell whether the UK in five or six years' time will end up being hit harder or less hard than other economies. But certainly, so far, the UK economy has been pretty hard hit um, by the pandemic relative to others. Yes, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, Paul said that uh, the, the, the 
decisions taken by the Chancellor were, again, I quote, almost entirely a set of policy choices unrelated to the pandemic. Uh, high inflation, rising taxes and poor growth still undermined more by Brexit than the pandemic. And that will see uh, real living standards barely rising and for many falling over the next year. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, is, is again, is this something that we're seeing elsewhere? Because well, is the UK uh, unique in this situation? Because if if it's not, then one could argue that uh, the UK is battling with just this, with not only the same issues that others face, Brexit excluded, of course. Uh, but um, we, we can't particularly criticise the UK government if indeed uh, other countries are doing just as badly. So is the UK doing specifically uh, poorly in terms of these issues? Well, there's different factors that are causing this. So next April, for example, there is a rise in national insurance contributions. That's to pay for more spending on the NHS and social care. That will reduce take-home uh, money in working-age people's pockets predominantly. That's an active policy decision to do that, to deliver better public services. And I think I'd argue that actually there's a strong case to say that that kind of measure perhaps wouldn't have been such a surprise even if the pandemic hadn't happened. So that's an explicit choice take money out of people's pockets in order to spend more on public services. There's a freeze in income tax thresholds coming in next April, which was announced last March. It is now the case that higher inflation, which other economies are experiencing too, means that that freeze will bite harder than what it would have done had inflation only turned out with what we'd have expected last March. And indeed, over the four-year period where that freeze is expected to be in place, we now think the government will raise taxes by about 11 billion rather than 7 billion. So it makes a huge difference. Um, but in particular, there's a bigger squeeze next April. And that's an explicit choice, again, by the Chancellor um, to put up taxes to try and deal with the damage to the public finances caused by the pandemic. Now, other countries may well have to do measures at some point. They'll have choices about how they do it. Do they want to cut that spending on public services? Do they want to put up taxes? They'll also have choices about how soon they go. And my, my suspicion is that the UK is going relatively soon. Um, so it might be that other countries are essentially avoiding the pain next April, but it's pain delayed, not pain they will never um, go through. And then there's, of course, rising inflation, as you just heard in the last session, which is occurring um, in many other countries too, which clearly eats into take-home pay for workers. Um, it also means that for those reliant on uh, interest income, it's eating into their incomes. There's also a phenomena for those who are, interest, who are reliant on benefit income in that their benefits next April will go up by the inflation rate that we saw in September. And of course, if inflation is now accelerating post-September, their living standards are going to be squeezed for a few months too. And it won't be a couple, you know, in a couple of years' time, they will catch up when their benefits are operated by inflation um, at that point. But certainly the next few months are going to be very difficult. I'd stress in particular for out of work households um, on benefits. And that's because the price rises are on energy. We know that low income households spend a relatively high share of their budgets on that. Out of work households have recently been benefiting from the £20 a week uplift in universal credit, which ran out um, uh, very relatively recently. And they don't gain from either, they don't directly gain from either the increase in the national living wage or the increase in universal credit um, that was announced in the budget. Yes, I know in the report it says that the primary of asset accumulation, the importance of asset holdings uh, has been prioritised over uh, improving living standards through earnings. And uh, this impacts particularly on uh, low income households. Would that be fair to say? The, well, the, 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 the fact that people with assets have had a relatively good, have done relatively well over the last 18 months is because of reductions in interest rates. So if you've got an asset which bears a set rate of a set amount of cash income and interest rates are lower, that asset increases in value. And you can see that in the housing market. Um, you can see that in the, the gilt market, too. So clearly, these kinds of effects are things that can benefit those with assets. And I guess perhaps one lesson from the legacy of the financial crisis is that maybe when making fiscal policy decisions going forwards, the Chancellor should pay a lot of attention to um, the distributional consequences of what's happening to interest rates, and in particular long-run interest rates. So if interest rates are going to stay low for a long while, that is going to reward people who went into this crisis, the most recent crisis with assets. And I think that's a consideration that does need to be reflected in any fiscal policy choices that the Chancellor is making. And I think with hindsight, Maybe the decisions made in the early 2010s didn't take enough account of 
um, the fact that, for example, those who've already got on the housing ladder did re relatively well over that period. Yeah, because if people are incentivised to invest in assets, they're less likely to perhaps in, uh, invest in you know, the productive elements of the economy, which are perhaps high risk, and that impacts on productivity and growth. Is that not the case? Certainly, there's a risk that um, lots of accumulated savings over the last 18 months, I think there's good reasons to think that they won't be spent in consumer spending very quickly. So the question is, how do they get invested? You know, maybe they'll get invested in very productive things across the economy. I'm sure that will be part of the use of it. But maybe they'll be ploughed into things like residential housing. And certainly there's a risk there that the UK economy might not be as strong as it could have been if lots of that money does go into residential housing rather than um, other productive uses. Now, of course, uh, inflation is leading to a uh, fiscal drag, which is a windfall for the Chancellor. But what's the impact uh, particularly on middle income uh, earners? Well, I think it's particularly important because of this freezy um, income tax threshold, the personal allowance and the higher rate threshold that was announced in the um, October budget. Uh, so what that means is essentially, sorry the, sorry, the freeze was announced in the March budget. So that freeze means that as incomes rise in cash terms, more and more people are brought into income tax, more people are brought into um, higher rate tax. It means that the higher inflation that we're now experiencing it means that those, those measures are going to bite harder than was previously expected. Um, so we we're seeing quite a shift in the nature of our income tax system, in particular the numbers brought into higher rate tax. And as I said before, if you'd asked me in March, I'd have pointed out that this, this four-year freeze is expected to raise about £7 billion um, a year by the end of the fourth year. We now think on current inflation forecasts it's going to raise more like £11 billion a year. Um, so it's a substantially... Um, bigger tax rise as a result of inflation being higher and therefore substantially bigger, a bigger squeeze on household incomes too. Okay, thank you. And just one more question for myself before I open out to colleagues. Uh, in, in his report, um, Paul said that over the period since 2010, health spending will have increased by over 40% and education less than 3%. Of course, that's, this is south of the border, which, is, uh, which implies a remarkable lack of priority afforded to the education system with indeed spending per student in FE and sixth form colleges remaining well below 2010 levels. And he goes on to say this is not a set of priorities which looks consistent with a long-term growth strategy. So what has been the impact on growth of these education uh, policies over the last decade or so? Well, we, I think the, the key point is that we know that spending on schools is going to have, if it's spent and spent well, will have effects on future productivity. Um, that's certainly one of the motivations for doing the spending. Whereas spending on health is a nice to have, there's clearly good welfare reasons to do it, but much of the spending will not lead to higher GDP in five, ten years' time, um, simply because much of the spending is going on people who are in the last, uh, sadly, in the last few months and years of their lives. So it's not about, it's not, you know, it's spending that has a good purpose and a good reason, but it's not about future growth. Um, spending, you know, the NHS in particular in England has not had particularly large increases by historical standards over the last decade. It's been under pressure because of an ageing pressure putting demands on its budget because of cost pressures. It's very difficult to make the health system uh, more efficient and for its efficiency to keep up with the economy more widely. And that's led to budget decisions to increase its budget pretty substantially, something like 40 per cent over a decade. Um, the school's budget has not been prioritised anything like that. In fact, we saw it in the Chancellor's budget speech where he made a big feature of the fact that um, in the, over the next few years we'll get spending per pupil in England back at, on schools back to the level it was at in 2010, so undoing the austerity that was experienced um, over the last 10 years. But that doesn't really seem to me something to brag about. We'll be spending the same per pupil in real terms in about 2024 as we were in, 2020, in 2010. Um, that's a remarkable period with no real increase in spending um, per pupil. And as I say, if that spending, if we kept spending at that level and had been done well, you'd think it would have some positive effect um, on future productivity. I'm afraid there aren't estimates of how much of an effect it would have had. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first uh, colleague to ask questions will be Deputy Convener uh, Daniel Johnson. To be followed. Thank you. <clears throat> I just really wanted to ask what the Institute for Fiscal Studies view is of the Comprehensive Spending Review for Scotland. I mean, my understanding is that we'll see a 7.7% increase in real terms in the first year, but then it is very front-loaded and actually small real terms decreases. So what I mean, my understanding is 7.7 is a historic 
uh, uh, high increase in terms of the block grant, but, but that profile leads to, I think, some challenges in terms of what that means over those three years. Is that sort of a fair characterisation? And are there any particular insights the IFS has in terms of the decisions that the Scottish Government has in front of it? Uh, so the spending review overall is clearly more generous than what the Chancellor told us even in September that it would have been because of his decision to top up the spending plans um, for the Westminster budget, which clearly does, as you say, have knock-on effects for uh, the block grant that Scotland will receive. There is some front loading. The Chancellor has, for example, a reserve in the near term that's bigger than usual, which I think is sensible behaviour um, given the uncertainty around the pandemic. Um, the money for local governments is very noticeably front well, government in England and Wales is very noticeably front loaded as well, which I think will mean that perhaps the first year for local authorities in England and Wales might be OK. After that, they might find they're quite reliant on council tax rises, which clearly has consequences about how hey, will they want to do those rises and be um, the areas that get the money from an increase in council tax might not be the same areas as where perhaps the spending needs and pressures are. Um, the capital spending is also relatively front-loaded, although there I'd stress that the government is essentially locking in what has already seen, where there's already been pretty big increases in capital spending. Um, so the government is really looking to hold capital spending um, at a pretty high share of GDP across the UK by historical standards. So the spending plans overall look um, like ones that don't imply cuts for most government departments, they are much more generous than we expected in September. They will imply bigger increases in the block grant than we would have expected. Um, back at the, in the run-up to the Scottish elections, we commented on the, some of the party's manifesto plans at the time. And looking at the SNP's manifesto, we certainly highlighted that there were several increases in spending in that manifesto, um, extensions of universal provision. And we questioned whether they would really be deliverable, given the UK government's relatively tight spending plans. Now, as it's turned out, what's given is that the UK has decided to make the spending plans relatively more generous, and it may well now be the case that the SNP can afford more, if not all, of the promises that were made in that manifesto. Um, but I don't pretend that there won't be some pressures going ahead, not least because no further austerity for English departments doesn't mean that you're undoing the austerity of the past in all of those budgets. Um, and there'll be some areas where spending is going to remain below the 2010 level for some time. Yes, we're returning to 2010 levels in schools. We're not in FE colleges. We're not in further education. We're certainly not in areas like the Ministry of Justice and the Home Office where spending has been cut very substantially. So I think there are some pretty big challenges still for many spending departments, although the budget increases won't be anything like as challenging as what they've been perhaps uh, used to over the last 10 years. Yes, if I remember correctly from the, the election that the IFS was very fair, that you were equally withering about all the, the manifestos, uh, which was very good of you. Um, uh, but uh, j just more specifically in the last session, we were, we were looking quite specifically at kind of the, the nature of uh, the rise of income tax receipts, the fact that, that Scotland wasn't seeing as, as big increases, uh, and, and the fact that we were seeing big differentials between sectors, and that, that that brings with it challenges. I mean, do you think there is sufficient public policy focus on on actually how we we plug uh, you know, either you know gaps in particular labour markets or or address these these differentials? That seems to be a new challenge, and one that is more challenging because of Brexit but doesn't really seem to be getting the focus from public policy, north or south, of the border that it needs to. Yeah, and I think um, Brexit is clearly a very big change to the structure of the UK economy, and you certainly could imagine some sectors doing relatively well out of it and some, some sectors struggling. Um, clearly, if you're um, reliant on exporting to the EU, it's going to be a much harder time for you, at least for the near term, than, for example, if you're a sector where previously you were competing against um, EU um, companies, for example. And you could imagine that the pandemic also raises challenges that are also going to be very, very different across sectors. Um, most obviously, if, for example, people's working patterns change, if their shopping patterns change, there'll be some sectors well placed to take advantage of that and some sectors that will take some time to adjust. So I think there is a big challenge for the UK economy as it goes through these big changes. 
I think the shift to net zero is another one where, again, some sectors will gain, some will lose, and that transition may well create some, some pain and some friction. So I think this is all of these areas where I think there needs to be a lot of attention um, of policymakers. I think in terms of the devolution settlement, I think what it throws up also is that, in some sense, the, the shock from COVID and the economic lockdowns were a shared shock right across the UK. It was broadly speaking, it wasn't the case that this was a shock that really hit Scotland or really hit England. And in some sense, I think that's fortunate given the fiscal arrangements we have. Um, I think the I think the lesson from it is really we need to think through carefully what would happen if we had another big negative shock that I guess in particular, what if a very big negative shock came along that was very concentrated on Scotland? Would our fiscal arrangements have really proven robust to that? And I suspect the answer is no. And in some sense we were Lucky is probably not the right phrase, but to the extent to which broadly COVID was not disproportionately harmful in Scotland compared to England was fortunate given the arrangements we have in place. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'll hand over, but I'm hoping one of my colleagues will pick up on that. That's a very interesting insight. We'll soon see. Uh, John, to be followed by Ross. Well, I'll change my plan and, and follow that <laughs> up. Um, so, I mean, do you think we should be seeking in the fiscal framework review changes to the, to the present system? I think that um, we, I think the UK wide should be thinking through the risks that are born framework and reviewing it in the light of big negative shocks come along. We've seen that after the financial crisis. We've seen that with COVID. Um, we must very much hope that the, the next negative shock won't be anywhere near as harmful as those. But I think the other thing we need to remember is that the next recession is never like the last. And COVID was a, a shock that, as I said just now, was something that, very broadly speaking, was UK wide. And I think we really need to think about, well, what about negative shocks that were very concentrated on one part of the UK? Um, and the framework we have strikes me as something that's not well placed to deal with a very bad negative shock that hit Scotland and not England or indeed not very well designed for one that hit England and not Scotland. And I think it's those kinds of stress testing. And I think that uh, if the we is what does the, you know, would the UK be better served by something that's better, more robust to the localised shocks? I think the answer is yes. And I think that we, we shouldn't be complacent that the next shock will prove to be uh, as general as the shock we've just been through. And just on, on that point, then, would, would the part of the answer to that be to give the Scottish Government or Scottish Parliament more borrowing powers? Would that be the way to deal with a more uh, geographical specific shock? I think that um, either giving more borrowing powers um, up front or having the flexibility to announce about extra borrowing powers very quickly were a negative shock to materialise. And I think that doesn't just apply to Scotland, I think it also actually applies to English local authorities, where we saw very uneven shocks, depending on their income streams, depending on their spending needs. The government in England decided to compensate local authorities with broad brush compensation that across the board looked reasonably generous, given the pressures they were facing. But you can still imagine some local authorities not getting enough. And it's very hard, very compensation packages and that, that, that suit that. And I think emergency borrowing powers are perhaps the obvious solution to that, or alternatively setting up in advance how those borrowing powers might work. But I think you certainly want them in your toolkit, is what I'm saying. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Uh, to, to move on to a different point, uh, I was asking the OBR about the long-term scarring effects. Um, and we actually only really got as far as the pandemic, and th their figure is 2%. So I was going to ask you if you agree with that, if you reckon that there is this... I mean, they were basically saying a permanent effect which we will never recover from compared to if we had not yeah. had the pandemic. And then the other part on that link to is then, well, what is the long-term effect of Brexit? Is that also a permanent effect or is that something we overcome in due course? And I think it's fair to say that economists pretty much, as much as economists ever agree, agree that the economy will be permanently smaller as a result of Brexit compared to what it would have been. Um, and I think there's good reasons to think the economy will be permanently smaller as a result of the pandemic relative to what it would have been. I mean, on the pandemic, I think it's pretty clear that while very fortunately unemployment has not been anything near as bad as we feared, it's still the case that some people were in good jobs and have lost those jobs. 
um, and they may never get back to as good a job as they would have had had the pandemic not happened. I think it's pretty clear that while while bankruptcies have been running very low, I still think it's the case that some businesses that would have been viable have proven to be have been, had a bad shock and have been knocked out of business as a result of the pandemic. Some businesses are probably now not – some investments in the UK are probably not located in the best places, given, for example, shocks to working patterns. Um, and we've also had a huge shock within our education system, where face-to-face -face tuition schooling has been messed up, where exam grading has been messed up. And it would be remarkable if that didn't have negative consequences going forwards. So I think there's good reasons why these effects are negative. Where we don't agree is on a number. Um, it's very uncertain. Um, I don't have a number for the 2%. IFS hasn't produced one. Um, but I would stress it's very, very uncertain. The OBR thought it would be 3% back in March. They think it's 2% now. I think that it, it, it will, it's good reason to think there will be a number. It won't be zero. It will be a negative hit. Um, the, we must hope that the next movement goes lower than two, but what moves in one direction could easily move the other way. And I think that's also a reason to think, well, actually, the Chancellor doesn't have a lot of wiggle room relative to the amount of uncertainty in the economy at the moment. OK, and I mean, you've mentioned and I think others have mentioned the, the whole kind of concept of a skills mismatch that we seem to have uh, vacancies in some sectors and uh, yeah, other people looking for jobs, perhaps not the right skills. And that's maybe been exacerbated by both Brexit and the pandemic. I mean, is that something that's just really going to sort itself over time, or is it something we should be seriously concerned about? I suspect in large part it will be sorted over time. You can imagine when you shut down parts of your economy and then reopen them, um, it's natural for there to be very high levels of vacancies. And when the economies change in its structure, it's natural for people to take time to adjust. It's natural for investments to take time to um, move. I think where we need to be particularly worried is where there are groups who we know find it harder to make those kinds of adjustments. Um, so, for example, if you'd asked me earlier in the pandemic, I would be highlighting not just older workers who are thrown out of work, but younger workers thrown out of work, ethnic minorities thrown out of work, where the, the impact of, you know, where they were disproportionately on furlough, they were disproportionately losing their jobs. I think the evidence now is actually that younger people and ethnic minorities have bounced back pretty remarkably strongly, and that's a big part of the good news story we have on unemployment. Um, maybe they found it; they're more able to move sectors, that they're more able to move to different employers. Um, but I think the story on older workers really hasn't got a lot better. Um, it's true their unemployment rate hasn't shot up, but there's many who've moved into economic act inactivity. So I think the worry is that they've moved into essentially uh, biding their time before they reach the state pension age. Maybe some of them are lucky enough to have decent private pension arrangements. Maybe some are not in that position. And I think there's a worry that they've prematurely moved out of the labour market in a way that may prove to be permanent. So I think that I'd suggest that policymakers, relative to what I would have thought earlier in the pandemic, need to perhaps be a little less worried about ethnic minorities and the young and a lot more worried about, relatively speaking, older workers. Um, and I guess the other group I'd always be concerned about in recessions are people who have low formal levels of education, but perhaps were working in jobs that look pretty skilled and had quite a decent wage. Um, so I guess in particular, there's quite a lot of men working in uh, productivity manufacturing that's geographically located. Um, Brexit in particular is a risk to those kinds of industries. And we know from the past that those kinds of workers find it very hard to get jobs that pay as well as the ones that they currently have. Thanks, Gavina. OK, thank you. Ross, we followed with Michelle. Thanks. Second with that point around uh, skill shortages and, and skills mismatches, Carl, could you expand a little bit on the, the sectors that are specifically experiencing a skill shortage as opposed to a labour shortage for other reasons like uh, wage pressure, migration issues, etc.? I think it's hard to disentangle the two. The, the work we did is looked at the took people's sectors and looked at the sectors they tend to move to. And obviously, lots of people stay in the same sector. So the vacancy rate in their own sector is very important. But there are some people in some sectors who move to other sectors. So the vacancy rate in other sectors um, also matters. So if you're the kind of person that works in a sector where you might tend to move into nursing or social care, for example, um, your vacancy rate is actually pretty high at the moment. Um, it's pretty clear that health and social care is going to be uh, a growing part of our economy for some time to come. Um, 
it's pretty clear that there's going to be uh, the, 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 the shortages in areas such as well publicized shortages in areas such as uh, lorry drivers, clearly partly caused by uh, the pandemic and partly caused by issues around Brexit. But I think in I think it's quite hard to identify from the, the work we've done how much is a, a skill shortage versus a, uh, other frictions that have that have that have come into the system. Of course, in the long run, the solution to even if it's a, a short run friction that's come in might be that domestic workers need to retrain um, to get skills for that sector and move across. And maybe more people who are uh, British citizens will end up doing, for example, the lorry driving around Britain. That may well be an outcome that we see um, over the next few years. Thanks very much. Moving on to a different area, you mentioned um, in your uh, initial remarks that most areas of UK government spending are going to avoid cuts over the next few years. They're basically going to be at the level of spending that was expected pre-pandemic. I'm interested, though, in, in how you're accounting for the the specific effects of COVID. So take transport uh, as an example. Real-time spending in transport uh, taking aside the kind of capital issues around HS2, et cetera, real-term spending and transport relatively steady over the next few years. But um, patronage of buses and trains is still way down. Operators are still requiring really significant subsidies. If the real terms, if the budget is essentially frozen real terms, there's no cuts, but substantial, uh, a substantial chunk of that money is having to go into operator subsidies that were not accounted for pre-pandemic. Is that not going to essentially result in a kind of a, a displaced austerity? There will be cuts, not to the overall budget, but within UK departmental budgets, there will be areas that are cut because they have to cover for the effect of COVID in other areas. Yes, I think that's a good point. I mean, in the in the health service, we've done some work estimating how big we think the the effects of COVID on the budget needs over the next couple of years will be, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty. But broadly speaking, we think the government's found enough money there already for the next couple of years to cover the kind of normal increases in NHS spending that you'd expect without a pandemic, plus the additional that we think will be needed as a central best estimate um, from the pandemic. Um, I think there are question marks about year three and whether there's enough money there. And it really wouldn't surprise me if the NHS um, ends up getting a top up um, towards the back end of this um, UK parliament. I think transport is an area where you're right to highlight, yes, budget increases. That's an area, though, where there'll be certainly challenges to the rail budgets, the bus budgets, if um, passenger numbers remain very, very low. Um, I think that's one of the areas where I'd recommend the Chancellor staying live to where might he have to allocate some, allocate some of the big reserve he's set himself. Um, if, tra if train numbers don't come back as strongly as he expects, that may be exactly the kind of area where you'd expect him to use the 10 billion or so he's got squirreled away. Um, so that's an area where there are budget increases, but I certainly agree pandemic pressures could be substantial and could persist for longer than um, we expect. Um, I think the other area where people highlight pandemic pressures is in the courts, but there I think the sums of money involved are actually quite a lot smaller. There'll be logistical issues about getting through the backlog, but I think there the kind, yeah, the, the, the money issue is not not the reason why the, the courts will be struggling over the next few years. Thanks very much. I'll leave it there, Convener. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Uh, good morning. Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, various uh, groupings that had been affected in certain ways, uh, ethnic minorities, young, old and so on, but you didn't mention women, given uh, often the flexibility they'll look for in various roles and their predominance in care and hospitality. I wonder if you just wanted to put on record your thoughts about them as a, a very vital grouping and your thoughts going forward of how specifically the public spending outlook might impact them? Yeah. Um, I think in terms of the, the raw employment numbers, I think the story there is not as bad as we feared earlier in the pandemic as well. I think so far it's not the case that women have suffered disproportionately from losing work um, paid work following the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, I guess in part, lots of women are disproportionately working in the public sector, um, which clearly has not had the same shedding of jobs as some parts um, of the private sector. Um, I think there's obviously big uncertainties about how things will play out going forwards. We know that much of the burden of the increase in caring responsibilities through the pandemic was borne by 
women rather than men. So men did more than normal, but women still took on more. Um, we don't know how, for example, widespread continued working from home will play out, whether, for example, fathers will continue to do more of the domestic chores um, that perhaps they were participating in through the pandemic, or whether an increased and prolonged period of working from home will mean it will be increasingly women who are trying to juggle doing two tasks at once, um, paid work alongside, uh, for example, chair caring for children. Um, the other thing we know that in particular uh, pre-pandemic, we know that for graduate women, um, it's periods of part-time work which really lead to them falling behind graduate men. And that's a big driver of the gender wage gap. So um, women with degrees essentially doing okay relative to men with degrees until they have that first child, then they move to part-time work, and then they fall increasingly behind in terms of their hourly pay, not just their, obviously their weekly pay falls behind, they're working fewer hours, but their hourly pay falls behind. Um, and I guess I don't know how that's going to play out with um, environments where if more flexible working, does that lead to more wet men working part-time, which could lead to more, you know, perhaps a more favourable situation for mothers who are working part-time, or will it be that women who you know, do more of the part-time work from home when working from home becomes more uh, common. I think there's a, there's certainly reasons there's reasons why you could be optimistic or pessimistic on that. It's certainly uh, interesting to think about going forward. Just another wee question. We haven't touched much on uh, structural issues highlighted within the economy as a result of COVID. And you were talking earlier about um, assets. And I mean, it's commonly held to believe that the uh, asset values across the UK are just over overinflated and this has been perpetuated for a long period of time because it's in a lot of people's interest. I, I'd appreciate your view of what what your current thinking is on that. Is that a view you agree with and what do you see happening going forward? And there may well be other structural issues that you want to bring out as well. Okay, I know. I mean, the, the value, if you have an asset like a house and the rate of interest falls, the value of that asset will grow. And that doesn't make it un undervalued in a financial sense. So a £200,000 house will be worth a lot more if interest rates are 1% than if interest rates um, are 2%, um, simply because the person you're, you know, people who you're trying to sell it to perhaps can just finance their mortgage um, less expense, uh, more cheaply. Um, so I hesitate to use the phrase overvalued, but I think what I was perhaps not very clear about earlier is I think that if we are seeing another prolonged drop in interest rates, which is what markets are um, indicating, interest rates are not just staying very, very low from post-financial crisis, but if anything, edging down even further, um, that has consequences. It means that people who already asset, have assets do well, people who haven't got those assets do badly. Um, so people who just bought their house, for example, do very well because they've got a they've made a geared purchase. Essentially, they own a small fraction of that asset, and yet the whole value of that asset is increasing in value. And I think fiscal policy decisions need to take that into account. And I guess the concern is that maybe through the 2010s there wasn't enough attention on um, who was winning from these asset effects, and what does that mean for the tax and the benefit reforms we want to be carrying out. So what role do we want, for example? It, for the taxation of capital income, the taxation of uh, inheritances versus the, the taxation of earnings. Um, so I guess one thing I'd point to is, for example, uh, the health and social care levy, for example, was levied, predominant, was levied on dividend income, yes, but also entirely on the earnings of uh, those in paid work. So it's not levied on those who are getting uh, rental income from a property. It's not levied on those who are getting private pension income. So people who've got investments that have shot up in value. And so I think this, the health and social care levy was a missed opportunity. Um, I understand that it's hard uh, politically to introduce a tax on pension income. Um, but I think the moment to do it might be the moment when you're saying, well, we're increasing this tax on everybody. Um, so workers will be paying in two. And actually, the money is pretty clearly going to go on the NHS and on social care, which will benefit, again, everybody. But I guess in particular, it's going to benefit those of pension age and those who, for example, for whom health care use and social care use might be 
on their immediate horizon. So I think it was a missed opportunity, and I think it's going to be quite hard for a subsequent government to say, oh, we're just going to include pension income in the health and social care levy. That would look like a very targeted tax rise on a particular group, rather than doing it at the outset when you're doing it on earners too. But I think it's those kinds of decisions that I think policymakers need to think through in the light of what's happening to asset values, in the light of who's gaining and who's not gaining from those changes in our economy, regardless of whether we think those assets are kind of overvalued or not. Liz. It's just one question, actually. Um, quite a few of the witnesses that have come to this committee have indicated that they think that consumer behaviour has changed quite markedly un in, under COVID. Um, do you have any way of um, estimating whether you think that uh, change is likely to be permanent? Um, I think it's pretty hard to say. We know there's been lots and lots of changes, um, essentially by design. This was a recession caused actively by government policy. Stay at home um, is an instruction not to spend in the economy, and lots of, lots of spending opportunities were clearly shut. Um, as you heard in the last session, that clearly led to government stepping in with lots of financial support, government borrowing rising and household saving going up very, very uh, to large amounts. Um, clearly not everybody was able to save, um, but many in particular middle and high income households did. Um, that has a number of consequences. If, if consumers bounces back to where it would have been without the pandemic, that would be a huge increase in consumer spending um, in the economy. That's even if no one runs down the savings they've accumulated. Um, I guess your question was also more focused also on spending patterns. I think it would be quite surprising if at least some of the change in behaviour didn't prove to be permanent. I think it would be surprising if, for example, people weren't perhaps spending a bit more on online um, spending opportunities, be it streaming opportunities, be it online shopping, and perhaps a bit less on other um, entertainment and social spending. I think at the margins it would be surprising if there wasn't a bit more working from home, which will change the location of where people are spending. Perhaps they'll still go, you know, maybe they'll go to cafes for lunch less. If they do, they'll perhaps be going to them a lot less in city centres and a bit more in other parts of the um, economy. Um, we've also seen evidence, for example, that you know, an early indicator of a permanent change, which I thought was quite striking, was the number of people applying to primary schools in London fell. And that looks to me like a large number of people deciding it's a pretty permanent decision that they're going to live uh, further away from the centre of London than what they would have done. Um, so I think there's good reasons to think that there'll be permanent changes. I think the hard thing to know is, you know, all of the changes we've seen won't be permanent. Um, for example, I'm now working in the loft office in London three days a week. I was doing that four days a week pre-pandemic. Um, so whereas during the pandemic, I was clearly in London zero days a week. So I think there'll be a, a large adjustment back to where we were, but not all of the way back to where we were. And I think where we are on that scale is hard to judge. And it will have big distributional consequences between industries, between parts of the economy, at the very local level, and between different types of households. For implications for savings patterns as well. Yes, particularly, as I say, that the observation that it's middle and high income households who've really been able to increase their savings, mainly because many of those were lucky enough to be able to work from home. So they didn't suffer any drop in their income. They just received their wage as usual. And lots of their spending opportunities were shut down. So they, they had a painful pandemic for many reasons. Economically, they weren't able to do the spending they'd like to do. So they were, their welfare was hurt in that sense, but their bank balance really wasn't hurt. And also, they found if they had, for example, investments, if they had owner-occupied housing, if they had a private pension in a defined contribution pension, they may well have found those assets shoot up in value too. Thank you. Um, the Institute of Fiscal Studies has been quite excoriating in its critique of the UK uh, budget. Um, and I noticed that one of the comments was that uh, a crucial ingredient in this year's policy decisions has been the way in which OBR forecasts appear to have driven policy. Now, you've touched on it a wee bit in response to Michelle's questions, but what um, can and should UK and Scottish governments do differently in terms of fiscal policy? Because there's been a lot of critique and understand that, given your role, but what more positive suggestions do you have in terms of how we can yeah. make things better? And I think the critique comes 
uh, mainly from the fact the Chancellor in September, as recently as September, was asserting he was going to keep to spending plans, which involve spending less, not more, than we were planning pre-pandemic, which I think looked pretty implausible, and now the government's not planning to do it. And I think the policy decisions being determined by the timing of OBR events comes from the OBR in March thinking long-run scarring was 3 per cent, Chancellor responding with tax, big tax rises, OBR in October thinking the scarring was only going to be 2 per cent, Chancellor responding with topping up the spending plans, not reining back on the tax rises. So it looks like an asymmetric uh, response. Um, so I think it's an interesting thought experiment to think what would, where would we be now had the OBR in March produced the same forecast as it did in October, had, the, had it said 2 per cent in March and just not changed its mind. Would the Chancellor have done, still done as big a tax rises? Or would he have done smaller tax rises? And would we now be talking about smaller tax increases and perhaps much more tighter spending plans? That's the, that's the questions we were raising. What do policymakers need to learn from this? I think, as ever, there's always a huge focus on the central forecast. How much is growth going to be over the next two years? What does that mean for revenues? Do we think there's going to be 3% scarring? And it's hard for policymakers, but not enough focus on the, well, what if things turn out to be 25% better? What if they turn out to be 25% worse? Um, how do we keep our plans to be, how do we give the certainty to spending departments to taxpayers that they want while remaining appropriately nimble to changing environments, borrowing more when we need to, borrowing less when that's appropriate, and tweaking policy when we want, but being clear that that's what we're going to do. And I think that's the ongoing challenge, to try and move away from a focus on a central set of numbers, and I see why they need to be produced, but more understanding of you know, the kinds of alternative scenarios the OBR are producing, the you know hope for the best, but perhaps prepare for the worst type um, of environment. And I think politically, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, but I think that's what we need to hear more of. So what would the UK Chancellor, what indeed would policymakers do were the Omicron variant to turn out to be much, much worse than we are hoping that it will turn out to be? What would be the response then? And what's the credible plan that we have? What happens if, for example, as we must all hope, scarring turns out to only be 1%? Is the Chancellor's priority to cut back on taxes? Is it more spending in some priority areas? And just more clarity over how how policymakers will respond to a changing environment, I think, would be a big step forward. OK, but whether we move away from the numbers or, or, or we keep the numbers, uh, the IFS has talked a lot about fairness, stagnating incomes, uh, lack of growth, lack of, pro lack of productivity. So what could and should the Chancellor have done differently in October? And what lessons are there for Scotland, given that our budget uh, process begins on Thursday? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, the one thing he did that I think was clearly right to do was set out a four-year spending plan for spending departments. For several years in a row now, we've had one-year spending plans for understandable reasons, uncertainty around Brexit, under uncertainty around being in the middle of the, the, the earlier waves of the pandemic. So I think the decisions for one year were defensible and indeed something we called for at one, at, at one point. But I think now on the public service side, I think the Chancellor's done the right thing. Set out clarity for your spending plans, but keep a big reserve on, in your back pocket that might be needed um, should plans need to be topped up, like the, the transport budget that we talked about earlier. So I think he's got that broadly right. Um, I think he's done well there. I think where the, what we haven't seen from the Chancellor is, well, where's his strategy for tax reform? Where's his long-run planning, which can both help fairness and help uh, growth? So... He did do a very good set of alcohol tax reforms in the budget, facilitated by Brexit, a set of reforms that we couldn't do before. The taxation of alcohol is going to look a lot better now than what it did under our membership of the EU, and he should be applauded for that. Um, but there are many other areas of government where we didn't, we haven't seen coherent thinking. We haven't really seen a coherent plan of what the long-run future for business rates should be. Um, we saw pretty small tinkering around air passenger duty, we heard yet another freeze in fuel duty with no plan for how we're going to replace that revenue when pretty much everyone will be driving around in electric cars and there'll be no very little fuel duty revenue, there'll be very little VED revenue. Um, so lots of areas where lack of thinking, and as I mentioned before, the new health and social care levy, is it really the case that we want to make it, you know, it's a progressive tax rise, it's broad based, there's lots and lots of lots to think it's a good tax rise, but could it not have been a bit better if we just expanded that tax base a little bit more, 
would that have been a bit more efficient? Would that have been a bit fairer too? So even where we have seen tax changes, I question whether they you know, have gone as far as they could have done. Okay, and what about Scotland? What kind of lessons can uh, can uh, we learn here from what the UK has done in terms of our own budget? We had six weeks to actually look at what's happened and reflect on the UK government. So for Scottish ministers, they'll be taking forward their own proposals uh, from Thursday. So what pitfalls can they avoid and what kind of uh, things can they do in a, in a positive sense? Yeah. Given the restrictions they have on um, policy, of course. Indeed. I think it's... it's my, my advice would be to pick... A subset of taxes. You're not going to suddenly try and do big tax reform across the board. Pick a subset of taxes that are your priority, where you think you've got um, the support um, plus the the wins from from making the changes. Um, you don't want to be rushing to things. You want to consult widely. You want to set up uh, the appropriate processes to get the reforms right. Um, but whatever area you pick, getting council tax right, getting business rates right. Um, getting air passenger duty right, whichever tax it is, um, I think you can pretty much pick any tax. Um, however good it is at the moment, it can be made better. Um, and you can do it in a way which raises revenue, which would obviously create losers, but make it work better. You can do it in a way which um, can be a giveaway. But, I, you know, it's, it's almost a case of, you know, pick what your priority is, be very clear about what your broad objectives are. Um, there's plenty of experts out there that can help you given those broad objectives, get the reform right. Um, it won't be easy to sell. It won't be completely plain sailing. The worse the tax, the more arbitrary there'll be some groups who are winning for bad reasons who will almost certainly not appreciate the tax reform happening. Um, but the, but the, the wins are there in terms of a fairer tax system, in terms of a more efficient tax system. Finish and this or... matters more given that we'll be, we're, we're going to have a high tax burden in the UK by historical standards. So... There isn't a right answer to how high should our tax burden be, but I can certainly guarantee you the higher the tax burden we have, the more costly it will be if that tax system isn't well designed. And in terms of spending priorities, what should they be, do you believe, for Scotland? I mean, given what's already been asked by Daniel about the fact that there will be a jump in uh, resources this year, but it will then decline in real terms over the following two years. Because sustainability of the public finances is obviously a major issue uh, for us here in Scotland. Indeed. And I guess that the, the, just like in England, I think the main determinant of how much money is for many government departments will be exactly how much money does the, depart, does the health service need. Um, it's such a large part of public service spending. Um, you can see it essentially driving budget decisions, fiscal policy across the board, let alone when you've got a kind of, you know, this is how much cake you've got to share across public services. Clearly, what, what you determine is the right allocation for the for the NHS is going to be a huge determinant of what's left over for um, everyone else. So I think getting that decision, um, balancing the needs of the NHS versus everyone else is going to be crucial. There's clearly a big decision about the social care budget, where um, big reforms in England to make the system more generous. To what extent does Scotland also want to make its system more generous? Does it need to spend that money on social care or would it rather spend um, the money elsewhere? Um, I think the, the, the education budget is clearly a priority. We, we spoke earlier about um, the fact that that really hadn't been prioritised over the last 10 years. I think I'd also add to that the fact that um, there's been a lot of clearly, there's been a, there's a generation who've had a bad experience in the last couple of years moving through the education system. But those who are still well within the education system, those still at primary school, for example, there is time for the system to make up um, the losses that they have had. Um, it's clearly harder for those who um, are older, who perhaps less left education, but for those who are still well within the system, I think this is our chance to make investments to make up for that lost in-person teaching, um, which risks um, harming them for some time to come. Daniel? I just had one final uh, question, very much following on what I was asking about in terms of labour markets, but taking a longer view. So the last two years have been a, a pretty brutal shock, uh, exposing our reliance on importing labour to make up uh, gaps and indeed fulfil uh, certain tasks that, that either you know, the, the, the UK population doesn't want to do or indeed a kind of you know, essentially low wage, low, low, low skill jobs. But in the longer run, if you look at global population growth, um, 
population growth globally was around 2% just under <coughs> through the 1970s. It's fallen to about 1%. It's projected to fall to half a percent in the middle of this century and, 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 and come to almost sort of a, an equilibrium by the end of the, the, the century. It strikes me that, 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 that any kind of model that assumes that we can continue to import labour is, is flawed, regardless of the other things that have happened. Um, I, I just So my question is, is, would you share that assumption? And if so, does there need to be more focus on essentially increasing the, the productive capacity of, of the existing population? Because that's what the, the economy will require, essentially working age people to be more productive, uh, whether that's skills or, or automation. And, and does there need to be more focus from public policy on, on that issue? I mean, a, a consequence of the, the population growth figures you point out, I think one is that um, as that works through the system, there's clearly going to be, that's, that, that in itself will drive an ageing of the population, which um, which is a little bit different to increases in longevity. And the increases in longevity can be people living longer in healthier states than not putting demands on the NHS. Changes in birth rates and changes won't make, won't, won't be a benefit for the NHS. It just means that you'll have more people at older ages relative to the numbers at younger ages. The consequence of that is that a higher proportion of people are going to have to work in health and social care and those types of services, which raises a challenge for productivity performance, given that those labour, those areas of the economy which are very labour intensive have been ones where historically we found it very, very difficult to deliver um, productivity gains. Um, the UK is a high wage economy relative to most of the world, and we're a small part of the world. So if we want to, we will be able to attract uh, people from overseas. I think that that's always going to be an option to the UK um, and indeed any small economy that has relatively high wages relative to most of the world. So that will always be um, an option. I think that the consequences for if we don't go down that route, the consequences for different industries will depend on Kind of as you as you said, the willingness of the domestic population to work in those sectors, which may require moving location, it may be a different kind of work, the ability of those sectors to increase wages to attract people. So if you're talking about lorry driving within England, that's always going to be something that needs to happen. I quite it seems quite plausible wages in that part of the economy can rise and it won't have that bigger effect on the prices that people face in the shops. Um, so that seems quite plausible, whereas there are some sectors where actually increasing prices isn't a plausible strategy. Um, they're competing perhaps against uh, in, uh, against other parts of the economy. Uh, maybe they're in hospitality in a remote part of the country where big price rises will mean people won't want to go. Maybe it's in agriculture where big price rises for those goods will mean that people will just buy, rather buy something else or they'll rather import something. Where essentially in the long run, it means those sectors won't, will we'll move away from doing those sectors. and. We will need to. There will need to be an adjustment to. And again, I think that does point to your point about skills training. What will people need to be doing? And you know, a, a focus on that would be a good idea. Um, and I think particularly a focus on further education, which has often been ignored in the UK. Um, you know, around half of young people going to university, getting university education right, is clearly therefore very important. But my guess is it gets more than fifty percent of the policy attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I mean, I mean, the issue of productivity is crucial because the sectors that, uh, where more and more people are needed, such as social care, are the areas where it's hardest to deliver the productivity gains that we would require. And I mean, the issue of of, of having um, a shortage of skilled labour for the high tech and, and more productive jobs that we, we need to keep the economy going and create the additional resources that we would want to invest in health and social care, etc. Um, obviously, are going to force up uh, wages over the over the short medium and indeed long term. How will this impact on our international competitiveness as a as a, a global trading economy? Well I think many of the forces we're seeing are global ones. So I think if we need to pay more if we get higher skilled people who are high productivity and they're getting paid more for it, they'll be producing more. I don't think that will be a particular problem. I think I'd point more that the bigger challenge I think is to the adjustments that firms have got to make to their uh, the markets they're accessing. Um, and I think I'd highlight that between the Brexit referendum and the actual date of Brexit, um, actually exporters had 
in some ways a relatively good time because they were still members of the single market and they had a depreciated currency and therefore were able to compete more easily than perhaps they would have been able to do had the referendum not actually happened or had the result gone the other way. So I think a bigger challenge is we know that co countries are a typically trade with the countries they've used to trade with. So opening up new options is always, always harder than expanding your, you know, protecting your existing market or expanding markets in countries you already trade with. So I think that's where the adjustments will be harder. So I think I'd see the challenge more around trade policy and companies able, in to, able to adapt to those new trading arrangements being a bigger challenge than the labour market. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we had 60 minutes for this session and we've taken just 15 seconds over that. So I want to thank Mr Emerson uh, for his short, sharp, direct and very stimulating answers uh, to our questions. So thank you very much. I'll now have a, a, a two-minute break um, while um, the, we move into private session. Okay, thank you. So this concludes thank you the very public much. session. Thank you.